Thank you, Lee. Thank you, ladies, for coming out tonight. Um, I think there's something vain about enjoying getting to speak to such a big group of ladies, but I, I, I will confess I do enjoy it. Um, if there, what time does the game start? Just to clarify, eight o'clock. So, it, can we figure out like a code where you can flash me scores and <laughs> since we can't raise our hands? All right. Um, no, I'm glad you're here tonight. Uh, covenant theology is a wonderful topic, um, and there's more to covenant theology than we could possibly uh, cover in three sessions. And maybe we'll mention some resources online as well that if you want to dig in more after the course, we've got a uh, Covenant Theology course on our iTunes account, and it's free. It's taught by Ligon Duncan, and so I think it's probably 13 weeks of, of lectures. So if you want to dig in deeper, um, that's a great place to go as well. But let me pray, and then we will get started. Jump right in. Our Father in heaven, we thank you that in your kindness to us, you have willed not only to be our maker and our redeemer, but you willed to be our God within the context of your covenant of grace and that you have made us your people. We thank you that you have purchased us with the blood of your own son. We thank you that you indwell us by your Holy Spirit. And we thank you that you've given us your word and Holy Scripture, whereby you reveal your promises to us, whereby you instruct us in a life that is pleasing to you, and whereby you open for us a living hope for the life we will spend and share with you forever in a new heavens and a new earth. We ask that tonight and in coming weeks, you would give us your Holy Spirit to teach us what you have revealed to us in your word about the covenant, that we might embrace you more fully as our God, that we might offer ourselves to you without reservation as your people. And we ask it in the name of the one who is the mediator of the new covenant, even Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Uh, Jad Packer is a name that probably many of you have heard of, read uh, the book Knowing God, and J.I. Packer somewhere says that Christianity is a matter of personal pronouns. Interesting statement. It says Christianity is all about personal pronouns. The idea is this. Christianity is not just about God. It's not just about people, but it's about God being our God and about us being his people. And that, in a sense, is what covenant theology is all about. What does it mean that God is not only our maker, that God is not only our redeemer, but that he has willed to be our God and that he's willed to make us his people? And that's what we want to talk about uh, over the next few months, over the next few sessions. Uh, a lot of benefits to studying covenant theology, and we'll glean some of these benefits along the way. Others we can leave to explore in further reading and and, and kind of looking at other resources. But let me just mention a few of the benefits of studying covenant theology to get ourselves started. First of all, and I think Lee just mentioned this, covenant theology helps us to understand how the Bible fits together. You know, understanding the Bible is about understanding little bitty pieces and parts, words, themes, people, places, and so forth. But it's also understanding how those little bitty parts fit into the whole picture. Uh, one, one writer describes covenant as the backbone of Scripture. Think about the, what your backbone does in, in your body, right? It really holds your ribs, it frames your, 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 your body. In a sense, that's what covenant does to Scripture. It's, it's not the only theme in Scripture. It's not even the central theme in Scripture. But it, but it is an integrating theme. It helps us to see how the different parts relate to the whole. And we'll see some of that even tonight. Uh, covenant also helps us see how the themes of grace and works fit together. As you know, that's a, that's a complicated thing, right? If you put works before grace, you're going to get in trouble. 
think that you know, we have to earn our way to salvation. But if you put grace without works, you're going to get in trouble with that as well. Well, covenant helps us to think about how grace and good works relate to each other. Covenant, and unfortunately we won't talk much about this, but this is a topic I love to talk about. Covenant helps us to think about how we rear our children. God in Scripture makes promises, covenant promises, not only to adults, but to children. And part of the instruction that he gives to parents is how to raise your children in the light of those promises. Covenant helps us to think about the sacraments. And again, it's a topic we won't talk too much about in this class. Uh, Paul in Romans chapter 4, verse 11, he says that circumcision, which was given to Abraham, he describes it as a sign and a seal. Well, the sacraments, baptism and the Lord's Supper, are also understood as a sign and seal specifically of God's covenant promises. And so the theme of covenant helps us to think about the sacraments. Uh, covenant also helps us to think about what it means for us to belong to God. We talk a lot in Christianity about having a personal relationship with God. And sometimes that can be a phrase that we use so frequently that it comes to really lack meaning, right? It's just something we throw around. It becomes a, a bleached term. But covenant helps us to understand what it means to have a personal relationship with God, what it means to belong to God. Uh, you remember, how many of you know the Heidelberg Catechism, right? First question of the Heidelberg Catechism, what is your only comfort in life and in death? And what's the answer? That I am not my own, but I belong, right? I belong to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. Well, covenant theology is all about belonging. Remember what Packer said. It's all about personal pronouns. And then ultimately, covenant theology helps us to understand what we're made for, which is a pretty important thing, right? Why are we here? What does it mean to be a human being? What are human beings for? Well, covenant theology is really central to addressing that question, and we will talk quite a bit about that question tonight and in the later weeks. Well, let me give you an overview of, of, of kind of what the plan is for the three sessions that we're going to have and then give you an overview of what we hope to cover tonight. So tonight, we want to work on Introduction to Covenant Theology. In our next session, we're talking about the theme of covenant as it unfolds in the Old Testament. And then in our last session, we'll talk about covenant within the context of the New Testament. So tonight, Introduction. Next time, Covenant in the Old Testament. And then the last meeting, Covenant in the New Testament. In terms of introduction tonight, I really want to focus on two different things. First of all, giving kind of a, a bird's eye view of the theme of covenant theology. Talk about what a covenant is. Talk about where covenant fits in theology. Like, what's its place in the, in the broader system of doctrine. And then talk about what the, the major covenants that we study in Scripture are. And then... In the latter part of our uh, session tonight, I want to talk about the first covenant that God makes with human beings in the garden, what's sometimes called the covenant of life or the covenant of works, the covenant that God makes with Adam and Eve. So first, look at kind of an introduction to covenant theology in a broad sense, and then talk about the first covenant that God makes with human beings in the garden, the covenant of works. All right, so first, broad introduction. First question we want to address is, where does covenant fit in the broader system of Christian theology? Uh, one way of describing the subject matter of Christian theology is to say that, God, uh, that theology is about God and all things in relationship to God. Theology has two subject matters, two topics. God, obviously, theology, it's discourse concerning God. That's what the term means. But it's not just about God, it's about God and everything else in relationship to God. You remember what Paul says in Romans 11.36, after he's been discussing the, the unfolding purpose of God in relationship to Israel and Gentiles, and he concludes with this glorious doxological statement. And he says, Of him and through him and to him are all things, to him be glory forever. Well, that's the perspective that Christian theology takes it wants to understand God, but then it wants to understand 
all things as from him and through him and to him. And so theology has a, a doxological orientation. Well, thinking about the, the subject matter of theology as God and all things in relationship to God helps us to locate where covenant fits. Okay? Covenant, the place of covenant in Christian theology, is in, in, in that relationship. But not just the relationship of God and all things, but in the relationship between God and creatures who are made in his image. Creatures who are made for a personal relationship with God. Creatures who are made for a relationship characterized by mutual knowledge and love of God. If you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, I turn to Psalm 95. We see this idea unpacked at length there. I'm going to read the entirety of Psalm 95. Verse 1, O come, let us sing to the Lord, let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving, let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God, and a great King above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth, the heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands form the dry land. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts, as at Meribah, as on the day at Massa in the wilderness, when your fathers put me to the test and put me to the proof that they had seen my work. For forty years I loathed that generation and said, They are a people who go astray in their heart. They have not known my ways. Therefore I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Now note a few things about this psalm, which is a, it's really a call to worship. It's, it's commonly used uh, as a call to worship in the context of public worship, right? It begins with a description of the reason to praise God because of who he is. He's the rock of our salvation, but he's described in verse 3 as a great God and a great king above all gods. Now, talked about covenant being about the relationship between God and creatures, but specifically about relationship between creatures made in his image. Well, here's where we can get a little uh, more color on, on that idea. The Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. Covenant is a theme that is specifically related to God's kingship. In fact, uh, one theologian named Meredith Klein says that covenant is the way that the divine king administers his kingdom. It's the, the, the instrument, if you will, by which he administers his kingdom. Now, here's the thing. God is the king of all creation, right? Not just human beings. He's the king of all creation. And in this psalm, we, we see a number of themes related to God's kingship over all creation, themes that are developed more fully in other passages in Scripture. But I want to draw your attention to, to just a couple of them in terms of God's kingship in relationship to all creatures. Uh, first is the idea of his possession of all creatures. Okay? Look in verse 4. After describing God as a great king above all gods, it says, in his hand, and think of the metaphor there, right? He possesses it. He owns it. He holds it. In his hand are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are his as well. They belong to him. They're his property. Okay? The sea is his, and, and look at the, the, the reason given. Why does the sea belong to him? For he made it, and his hand formed the dry land. Here's the idea. By virtue of the fact that God created all things, he owns all things. Okay? He owns the copyright on everything in heaven and earth and the seas and all their depths. Okay? That's part of what God's kingship means. He made it all, 
and he owns it all. Now, God has made any number of different kinds of things. And later on, we're going to look at uh, the opening chapters of Genesis where we see uh, Moses talking about the various things that God has made. And according to the psalmist, and this is the most exhaustive way the psalmist can think of saying it, God owns everything that he made. Right? Well, part of what goes with God owning everything he made is that he disposes of everything he made in the way he see fits. Okay? Now, the trick is God likes the creatures that he made, and so God moves creatures and guides creatures to, to act in accordance with their natures. Okay? He, he, by his sovereign kingship, empowers dogs to be dogs and cats to be cats and trees to grow as trees and so forth. Okay? So the God who possesses all things in his hands, he moves all things. He, he is the, the empowering presence that gives life to all things. And in doing so, he directs all things to their various ends. And again, as there are a variety of creatures, there are a variety of kinds of ends for creatures, right? There, there are a variety of what you might say pictures of what it means for different kinds of creatures to flourish, right? It's one, things for, one thing for a dog to flourish, right? It's another thing for a duck to flourish. And God, in moving and empowering different creatures, is trying to enable them to be everything that he made them to be. The idea is this. Creatures have a history. Right? It takes them time to grow. It takes them time to become what God wants them to be. That's not true of God. God is fully actualized. Right? God is eternal. He, he's the fullness of life. He's the, the, the blessed and only sovereign, Paul says. King of kings and Lord of lords. But, but for a creature to become the fullness of what God made us to be, it takes time. And so God possesses creatures. He moves them. He empowers them. And he does so to, to make them fully what he wants them to be. And that's true of God's sovereign relationship to all of God's creatures. Well, what's covenant? Covenant is how God, the sovereign king, right, exercises his relationship to creatures made in his image. And this shapes the way we think of how God possesses creatures made in his image, how God moves them and, and empowers them to be what he wants them to be, and how he guides them towards their ultimate flourishing to his glory. So, again, look, look back at Psalm 95. Look at the, the language we have here in verses uh, 6 and, and 7 and following. The psalmist again calls us to come before the Lord, to worship and to bow down, to near, kneel before the Lord our Maker. And what's the reason that is given? For he is our God. Remember I said covenant theology is about personal pronouns. Well, look at the description there. It's not just because he is a great God that we should worship him. That is a reason to worship him. But it's because he is our God. Okay, we'll talk a little bit later about Leviticus 26.12 and other verses which say the same thing. But Leviticus 26.12, God promises, I will be your God and you will be my people. So see, the reason the psalmist is saying we should worship God is what? He is our God and correspondingly, we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. We are his people. So first of all, covenant theology says something about how God possesses us. He, he possesses us with, within the context of this personal relationship, within the context of a covenant bond. And again, you think of the, the Heidelberg Catechism. What's your only comfort in life and death? That I'm not my own, but that I belong. That's the exact same note that the psalmist is striking. We'll say some more about the practical implications of that later. But note also, not, not only does covenant say something about how we belong to God, we belong to him within the context of a covenant relationship. It's how he owns us. It's how he possesses us. You think about it like this, right? Uh, we all own different things, right? We own an iPhone. Maybe we own a car. We own a house, okay? But many of us also own spouses, children, 
Maybe we own a business. Now, why does that sound weird for me to say it like that? Is it because that your spouse doesn't belong to you that it sounds funny that I say that? Is it because your children don't belong to you that it sounds funny that I say it? No. It's that when you speak of owning someone instead of something, you have to translate into a different register, right? The thing is, spouses are our property, but, but they're a different kind of property, right? They're persons, and, and, and you use your car, but you don't use your spouse, right? You use your iPhone, but you don't use your children, right? You translate that relationship of belonging to a different register, and that's exactly what the Scripture says God does in relationship to us. Those he made in his image, okay? Those he made to know him and to love him, he doesn't relate to us like he relates to inanimate objects or even to animate objects that are not human beings. He relates to us in a special way. He owns us in a special way. We belong to him in the context of the covenant, and he belongs to us. But the second thing is, therefore, as his ownership of us is expressed in a unique way in the context of, the co in the context of covenant, so is the way he moves us to be the kind of creatures he made us to be. So is the way he guides us. And again, look, look back at uh, Psalm 95. We are the sheep of his hand. We are the people of his pasture. What's the metaphor being used there to describe God's covenant relationship to us? It's a metaphor of a shepherd and a sheep. Right? One of the, the, the great psalms that many of us probably know by heart, Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. What's that psalm all about? How God leads us, how God guides us, how he provides for us, how he protects us, how even in the valley of the shadow of death, what he is with us. Well, notice how the psalmist says that God leads us, leads his covenant people. Again, it's at the end of verse 7. Today, if you hear his voice. Now, we're going to look at this more fully in a moment when we look at Genesis chapter 1 and 2. God speaks about all creatures that he's made. In fact, he speaks them into being. Let there be light, right? Let there be this animal and that animal and let the earth bring forth and so forth. But there's one kind of creature that God doesn't just speak about, but that he speaks to. Okay? And again, just as covenant says something about the unique way that God possesses us, within the context of a personal relationship, we belong to him, he belongs to us, so it says something about the unique way he guides us and leads us to be what he's made us to be. And how is it? By his voice. He addresses us. He presents himself to us and says, Behold, I'm your God. You are my people. He reveals to us his will. One of the, the lovely things that Moses says about the Lord at the conclusion of Deuteronomy 30. We'll probably look at this next time. He says, don't say in your heart, who's going to ascend to heaven, or who's going to descend to the depths, or who's going to go to the farthest parts of the sea to find God's will, because it's near you. And, and you know what Moses is saying there? That many religions, the idea is you can't really know what God's will is. It's a mystery. What, what Moses is saying is, that's not how your God is. He speaks to you in plain words. Right? God is not like a deadbeat parent who one day you know, the kid thinks they know what the, the parent wants them to do and, 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 and the parent's pleased with them. The next day they do the exact same thing and the parent gets mad at them. They never know where they stand. This is what Moses is saying. That's not our God. He speaks clearly. He reveals his will to us clearly by his voice. Well, again, if you think of God's kingship, he, he possesses all creatures. He moves them and empowers them to be what he wants them to be. And we see that covenant shapes the way we think about how he possesses us, about how he moves us with his voice. He addresses us. He guides us as a shepherd who speaks to his sheep, who knows his sheep by name. Well, God's kingship, remember, it also is about directing creatures to the ultimate ends, to the purpose that he made for them. And we see this is true of covenant as well. Now, in the context of Psalm 95, it's stated really in a negative light. Okay? The idea is that because Israel has been hard-hearted, okay, because they have refused to heed 
their good shepherd's voice. Okay? They're not going to realize the good end, the good purpose that he has appointed for them. But nevertheless, the psalmist tells us what that good end and purpose is. And it's a theme that later the book of Hebrews picks up and says that good end and purpose remains for the people of God to possess. And what is it? The last phrase in Psalm 95. My rest. Now, what the author of Hebrews tells us, he says, what is that rest? He says, it's not the rest that Joshua gave to Israel when they entered the promised land. What rest is it? Well, he says, remember when God created the heavens and the earth? And he created in the course of six days. And on the seventh day, what does it say? God rested from his labors. We'll come back to that theme in a moment. They say, well, that rest that God finished at the beginning of the world, that's the goal he's been holding out for human beings from the beginning of creation. And what the author of Hebrews says is Joshua didn't lead Israel into that rest. David later in Psalm 95 speaks about this rest, but it's something that lies ahead. And the psalmist says, I mean, the author of Hebrews says, now in Christ Jesus and through faith, right, we are being granted the possibility of entering into that rest. And as we'll see in a moment, one of the, the ways that the Bible describes what we're ultimately made for, the chief end of man, if you will, is to enter God's rest. Augustine, in his great book, The Confessions, he begins by saying, you've made us for yourself, and our hearts are what? Restless until they find their rest in you. And that's something that covenant theology speaks about as well. So covenant is an expression of God's kingship, but it's an expression of God's kingship in relationship to creatures made in his image. It says something about the way he possesses us, about the way we belong to him, and about the way he belongs to us. It says something about how he moves us and guides us and leads us as a shepherd with his own voice. And it says, says something about where he's leading us. Right? It says something about his ultimate goal for us, that we might enjoy his rest. Well, a couple other things by way of kind of broad introduction to the theme of covenant, and then we'll look at uh, Genesis 1 and 2 and the theme of the covenant that God made with Adam and Eve in the garden. But briefly, I want to talk about what a covenant is, okay? How do we define covenant? And then what are some of the major covenants that Scripture speaks about? And that will help us to kind of think about how the covenant with Adam and Eve relates to other covenants in Scripture. So first, what is a covenant? I'm going to give you a definition from a scholar named Gordon Hugenberger. Here's how Gordon Hugenberger defines covenant. He says, a covenant in its normal sense, is an elected, as opposed to natural, relationship of obligation under oath. A covenant in its normal sense is an elected, as opposed to natural, relationship of obligation under oath. What does that mean? Well, covenant, in, according to Hugenberger's definition, involves four things. First, it involves a relationship. We've seen this already. Because it's an elected relationship, it's a chosen relationship as opposed to a natural relationship, it's a relationship with a non-relative. Now, as Hugenberger says, we'll see more in a second, it creates a family bond where there's not one. That's why marriage is a covenant. Okay? It's a relationship with a non-relative and includes obligations for both parties in the relationship, there are commitments that are made, right? And these commitments are binding. And then it's a, it's a relationship that is established by an oath. And the oath can be made with words or signs or both. That is really the essence of Hugenberger's definition of covenant. Now, we can think about a couple of, of examples of this in Scripture that will help us to, to, to see what he, he's talking about. Uh, the first one is within the context of marriage. And, and Hugenberger's book on covenant is really about the marriage covenant and how 
marriage is really a paradigm for understanding not only covenants on a horizontal level between human beings, but covenants on a vertical relation, uh, vertical level between God and human beings. So think of uh, the, the latter part of Genesis 2, where uh, first time in, in, in the Bible where God says something is not good. And what is it? It's not good that man should be alone. And so uh, God brings before Adam all the animals, and it says not a, a helper fit for Adam wasn't found. So what does he do? He puts Adam to sleep. He takes his rib. He forms Eve. And then Adam wakes up. And you remember you get the, the first kind of poetic verse coming out of a human being's mouth in Scripture. At last, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. Well, what's happening in Genesis chapter 2, while it's not called a covenant, Later scripture looks back, Malachi chapter 2, for example, looks back and calls that a covenant relationship. Well, what's happening there? Well, it's a relationship. It's marriage, right? It's, it's a relationship with a non-relative. Now, in Adam and Eve, we have a special case here because right, it's not like they could have been brother and sister because they're the first couple created by God. But you remember what Moses then says after the, the, the creation of Eve, after Adam's declaration Regarding Eve, he says, for this reason, what? A man shall leave his father and mother, right? And the two shall be joined, they shall become one flesh. Well, this is the idea. The husband comes from one family, the wife comes from another family, and they come together in a marriage, okay? And those who were formerly not relatives are now relatives. And by the way, this is the point of the language, behold, bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. He's used in other places in the scripture just to describe a family member. Okay, And so what Adam is now saying is, you're my family. You're my kin. It's a relationship that entails obligations. And we understand how Scripture talks at length about obligations for husbands and wives and so forth. And you see that all covenant relationships from Scripture have obligations on both sides. Um, but what I want you to, to note here, and it's interesting in thinking about Genesis chapter 2 and, and the marriage covenant with Adam and Eve, is that what, what distinguishes covenants in Scripture is that they're formalized by an oath. And that oath can be an oath that's spoken with words or it can be an oath that's performed with signs. Now, where is the oath in Genesis chapter 2? Well, the answer is it's in that statement that Adam makes when he sees Eve. Okay? He's not just saying, look, there's a woman. Okay? This is like a wedding vow. Behold, you are now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. Okay? He's formally receiving her as his wife. Right? He's formally giving himself to be her husband. Now, sometimes the oath is done in a formal way in Scripture. Remember Genesis 15, passage we might look at next time. Abraham's asking God, uh, listen, you made promises about offspring, you made promises about land, and I hate to bother you about this, but I don't see any offspring, I don't see any land. And you remember what the Lord does. He, he brings Abraham out, he says, look at the stars of the heavens, so shall your descendants be. And then he says, look in every direction, basically all this is going to be yours. And then the Lord performs this very interesting ceremony where he, he slaughters an animal, right? And it says that the Lord passed through the, the, the torn parts of the animal. And he makes the solemn oath that Abraham's going to possess the land that he's promised to give him. Well, that's a symbolic act that functions as an oath. Okay? And, and we know from, from other parallels in the ancient world, but also in the Bible itself, that this kind of oath essentially says, may what happened to these animals happen to me if I don't keep the covenant promise that I've made to you. But the point is that whether it's with words, in the case with Adam and Eve, or whether it's through symbolic action, what, what distinguishes a covenant from other just relationships, right? Facebook friends or something like that, right? It's formalized with this oath. It's a, it's a, o. Palmer Robertson calls it a bond in blood. The idea is that there are consequences. This is a, a serious, formal, and solemn relationship. 
Well, I mentioned already Leviticus 26.12. The essence of the covenant, right, is that relationship between God and his people. I will be your God and you will be my people. And it's really not only the essence of the covenant, it's the end of the covenant. It's the goal of the covenant. Right? Uh, uh, there's nothing beyond the relationship between God and his people for which the covenant aims. That's the purpose of the relationship. Right? It, it, it's, 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 it's like a friendship. Right? A true friendship is, is, is a relationship that doesn't just exist for the sake of something else, to accomplish a job, to pull off a task, right? The, the true end of a friendship is the relation between the friends, okay? And, and this is the ultimate goal of the covenant, okay? The fellowship between God and his people. It's the essence of the covenant. I'll be your God. You'll be, you'll be my people. But it's the, the goal of the covenant. It's the end of the covenant as well. Well, what, what major covenants then does Scripture deal with? I want to mention two broad categories, but then talk about some subcategories, and that'll help us think about uh, the topics we want to cover tonight and then in the remaining weeks. Uh, the two broad categories for talking about covenants in Scripture are the covenant of works, which is what we call the covenant that God made with Adam and Eve in the garden, and then the covenant of grace. And the main thing that distinguishes these two covenants, well, there, there's, there's two main things that distinguish, distinguishes them from each other. The first thing is the covenant of works was made with human beings before the fall, before sin. It's how God related to Adam and Eve in a, in a, in a good and perfect world. Okay, where, where, where they were upright, right? Where, think of how Genesis 2 concludes there. They're before each other. They're naked and unashamed. Their, their consciences are clear before God and before each other. Right? The covenant of works describes the covenant that God makes with creatures within that context. The covenant of grace refers to the covenant that God makes with people after sin. Right? Where he seeks to reconcile human beings to himself. When, he, he, when, when those he has made and, and who have rejected him, he he buys them back, to use the, the metaphor of redemption. That's what redemption is, is reclaiming something that belongs to you, right? Putting it back on track so it can fulfill its purpose, okay? Well, the covenant of grace is a redemptive covenant. Now, the trick is this, and this, oh, sorry, other difference between the covenant of works and covenant of grace is this. In the covenant of works, there's no mediator because there doesn't need to be a mediator, right? Saviors presuppose sin, right? But where there is no sin, there doesn't need to be a savior. But after the fall, after the entrance of sin into the world, God's covenant of grace needs a mediator, right? And we know who the mediator is. There's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. He's the one that the book of Hebrews calls the mediator of the new covenant. And so these are the two major differences between the covenant of works and the covenant of grace. Covenant of works is God's covenant with human beings before the fall, made with Adam and Eve in the garden. Covenant of grace is the covenant God makes with human beings after the fall, and it's a redemptive covenant. Covenant of works doesn't have a mediator because it doesn't need a mediator. Covenant of grace needs a mediator, Jesus Christ. Now, here's where we get into subcategories. When we think about how the covenant of grace unfolds, it unfolds across both Testaments, Old Testament and New Testaments. Sometimes people think, oh, covenant of works, that's the Old Testament. Covenant of grace, that's the New Testament. No, that's bad. That's wrong. Okay? God is gracious towards sinners in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Okay? Uh, and if he weren't, sinners would have no hope of relating to him. Okay? So, same religion in the Old and New Testaments is governed by the covenant of grace. However, across the Old and New Testament, God does make various covenants that really are various expressions of the covenant of grace. And we can mention some examples of those. You've got the covenant with Abraham, the Abrahamic covenant. You've got the covenant with Israel through Moses, 
Call that the Mosaic Covenant or the Old Covenant. You got the covenant that God makes with David, the Davidic Covenant. And then you got the covenant that is described in Jeremiah 31 as the New Covenant, or in Jeremiah 32, it's described as the Everlasting Covenant. Isaiah uses language of Everlasting Covenant. Elsewhere, it's called the Covenant of Peace. It actually has a number of different names, but we usually use Jeremiah 31's label, the New Covenant. Now, the trick is this. Really, all of these covenants, while they are different covenants, and they have different features, and we'll look at the different features of these covenants in, in, in later weeks, they're also expressions of one covenant purpose. And that one covenant purpose is what we call the covenant of grace. Very quickly, let, let me show you something that, that is really neat. Genesis chapter 17, within the context of the Abrahamic covenant. Remember earlier I said Leviticus 26.12, I will be your God, you will be my people. This is the essence of the covenant. Well, look at Genesis 17. Genesis 17, the Lord says to Abraham, I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And I'll give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. Now, that language at the very, the very end of verse 8 sound familiar? I will be their God. I will be your God. Okay, well, that covenant formula, I will be your God, you will be my people, guess what? This is the first time it's mentioned in Scripture. I will be their God. And where is it mentioned? In the context of the Abrahamic covenant. Now, you ever wonder why it doesn't say, and you'll be my people? Any guesses? Oh, God. Okay, no guesses. Because Abraham's not a people. Right? He's talking about your offspring. Now, by the time the book of Genesis closes, Abraham will have had a son named Isaac. And Isaac will have had sons, and, and Jacob will be the, the heir of the covenant promises, and then Jacob will have 12 sons. And there's the whole story of Joseph and everything else. But guess what? Even in at the end of the book of Genesis, Israel is not a people. It's a family with tribes and clans and so forth, but it's not a people. You know the first time Israel is called a people? Exodus chapter 1. When they go to Egypt, what happens? They become fruitful, they're multiplying, they're filling the land, and now they become large enough to be described as a people. And so you know what the Lord says in Exodus chapter 6, within the context of talking about what's going to be called, become the Mosaic Covenant. He says, I will take you to be my people. And so in Leviticus 26, 12, which is in the context of the Mosaic Covenant, I will be your God and you will be my people. Now, in the Davidic Covenant, it takes a slightly different flavor and we won't talk about it right now. But when the New Covenant comes along, Jeremiah 31 Jeremiah 31 is, is, is a very important passage for covenant theology we'll have to talk about later. But he says, um, Behold, the days are coming. I'm going to make a covenant with you, not like the covenant I made with your fathers when I brought them out of Egypt, which is which covenant? The Mosaic covenant. The covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them. And what does he say? It's going to be something different. It's going to be nothing like the Mosaic Covenant. That was a terrible idea. I don't know what I was thinking. No. He talks about writing the law in their hearts. What law? The law he gave to Moses. He talks about uh, the, the, there not being need to, to teach each other anymore. He talks about the, the full and final forgiveness of all their sins. I'll remember your sins no more. But you know what also he says in Jeremiah 31, verse 34? And I will be your God and you'll be my people. What's the point? Okay, these are all different covenants. But all of these covenants are about that one fundamental covenant relationship. The promise that God made to Abraham. I will be your God and you'll be my people when you become a people. And in the new covenant, even though you broke the covenant relation, you were an unfaithful spouse. 
to use the language of Hosea, the language of Ezekiel, I'm going to remarry you. And I will be your God, and you will be my people. Some people are uncomfortable speaking about one covenant of grace throughout Scripture. They say, well, it's better to describe it as one plan, okay? One purpose. And that's fine. I mean, those are biblical terms as well. But, but when you lose the label and the language of one covenant of grace, you know what you lose? That the heart of God's plan, that the heart of God's purpose is a promise. It's a relationship. It's God's faithfulness to his people through thick and in thrin, through death and resurrection. And that's the, the importance of the language of one covenant of grace. All right. So uh, where does covenant fit in theology? It's an expression of God's kingship. right? It's how he relates to creatures made in his image that belong to him by virtue of the covenant. It's how he guides them with his voice. It's how he directs them to their ultimate end of rest in him. What is a covenant? It's a relationship with a non-relative that has obligations on both sides. It's sealed with an oath. And which covenants are in Scripture? Principally two, covenant of works, covenant of grace. But the covenant of grace has various administrations, Abrahamic, Mosaic, Davidic, and new. And when Paul says in 2 Corinthians 1.20, in him, in Christ, all God's promises are yes. What promises he's referring to? All the promises that God's made in all his covenants with his people. They're all yes in him and through him, amen to the glory of God. Well, what I want to spend the last bit of our time tonight doing is looking at this first covenant in scripture that God makes with human beings. The covenant of works. And so let's turn our Bibles to Genesis chapter 2. Now, I'm going to let you in on something. It's not a secret because if you read Genesis chapter 2, you see it for yourself. The word covenant is not used in Genesis chapter 2. And that fact has led some people to say, there, there's not a covenant in Genesis chapter 2. In fact, there's no, there's no such thing as the covenant of works. Uh, oftentimes the people who don't like to label the covenant of grace also don't like this as a label either. And they'll say, well, obviously there's an Abrahamic covenant, there's a Mosaic covenant, but these are different things. Don't mix them together. And there's no covenant of works. Well, I actually think that that view is a little bit short-sighted. And I actually think it's a view that, that is perhaps passable on kind of a superficial reading of Genesis 2. But I think that if you look more closely as what is going on there, as well as some later texts in the Bible, that we'll see actually, no, there is a covenant. In fact, there are two covenants in Genesis chapter 2. Neither one of them is called a covenant in Genesis chapter 2. Uh, here's the thing. There's a really important principle in reading biblical narrative. And, and when we don't, we're not aware of this principle, it can, we can kind of stub our toes in a lot of different ways. It's, it's something you, those of you who were in the, the last uh, class talked about when you talked about interpreting biblical narrative. And here's the principle. Biblical narrative is more interested in showing its doctrine than it is in telling its doctrine. Okay. Biblical narrative doesn't tend to be preachy. Right? It doesn't tend to kind of point like this and say, here's what I'm trying to get across to you. Okay? It wants to show you indirectly. It wants to paint a picture. The principle is this. If it looks like a duck, if it walks like a duck, waddles like a duck, if it quacks like a duck, then you're supposed to conclude what? It's a duck. Okay? And really that's the principle with a, a lot of how biblical narrative teaches us. It doesn't often say, here's what I'm trying to tell you. It, it, it shows you something quacking and waddling with webbed feet, and it expects you to be able to draw the right conclusion. Okay? Well, that's what we have when it comes to the covenant in Genesis chapter 2. Okay? The, 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 the author is painting a picture of a covenant, and, and while he doesn't describe it as a covenant, if we understand how covenants work, we see all the elements there, and we're to conclude, ah, it's a duck. No, it's a covenant. Now, having said that, uh, I mentioned there are two covenants in Genesis chapter 2. 
One covenant is the covenant God makes with Adam and Eve. What's the other, other covenant in Genesis chapter 2? The marriage covenant, right? Between Adam and Eve. Now, why do we call that a covenant? Well, it looks like a duck, waddles like a duck, quacks like a duck. But also, Malachi chapter 2 says marriage is a covenant. Right? And so, later scripture, looking back, can say that was a covenant. We say, yeah, we thought so. Right? Thank you very much. Guess what? Second chapter... Second Samuel chapter 7. What's second, chapter, second Samuel chapter 7 about? The Davidic covenant? Guess what? The word covenant is not used in Second Samuel chapter 7. Later scriptures say that's the Davidic covenant, but not in Second Samuel chapter 7. Now, one more secret. There is a place in scripture that looks back and says, hey, that was a covenant. And you know what it is? Hosea chapter 6, verse 7. God is rebuking Israel for their infidelity to the covenant. And you know what it says? You, like Adam, have broken the covenant. What's the assumption there? God made a covenant with Adam, just like he made with Israel. And just like Adam broke the covenant, you have followed your father's example and done the same thing. So, I think there's good reason to see a covenant at work in Genesis chapter 2, but I want us to, to dig in a little bit more deeply into the details and, and, and confirm this idea. So, if you have uh, your Bibles, let's look at Genesis chapter 2, verse 4, and I'm going to read through verse 17. Genesis 2, 4. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created, and the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. When no bush of the field was yet in the land, and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the land, and there was no man to work the ground. And a mist was going up from the land and was watering the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden, in the east, and there he put the man whom he had made, whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river flowed out of Eden to water the garden, and there it divided and became four rivers. The name of the first is Pishon. It is the one that flowed around the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold, and the gold of that land is good, and Delium and Onyx stone are there. The name of the second river is Gihon. It is the one that flowed Around the whole land of Cush, the name of the third river is the Tigris, which flows east of Assyria, and the fourth river is the Euphrates. The Lord God took the man, and he put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. Now, what I would suggest to you that in, in Genesis 2, 4 through 17, we really have all the pieces for, for understanding the covenant relationship that God enters into with Adam and Eve in the garden. First, I want to make a comment about verse 4 itself. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth. Uh, different books of the Bible have different things themes and different kind of turns of phrase that are often kind of structural clues to, to the author's intention, to, to the way he's, he's kind of setting up the, the story he's trying to tell. Well, this phrase, these are the generations of, is one of the structural clues that the book of Genesis uses to, to help us understand the flow of his argument, the flow of the story he's trying to tell. And every time he uses this phrase, he, he does the same thing. He draws upon a kind of larger family tree and he picks one person out within that broader family tree and he begins telling their story. So the example of this is Genesis uh, chapter 37, okay, verse 2. It says, these are the generations of Jacob. Okay, and who is Jacob? He's one of Isaac's sons, right? one of the heirs of, of the covenant promise. These are the generations of Jacob. But if you think back to the book of Genesis, and you think about 
kind of major sections and who are the main characters in the, in the main se- major sections of, of the book of Genesis. When you think of Genesis chapter 37, all the way through Genesis chapter 50, which is the last chapter of the book, who's the main human character in those chapters? Joseph, not Jacob, right? These are the generations of Jacob, and then you're going to tell Joseph's story? Well, yes, because that's how that phrase works. You talk about a bigger family tree. He's talking about Jacob's family. But they use it as a way of introducing one character that you want to focus on. Okay? So here's the thing. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth. The point is not that he wants to tell us more about the heavens and the earth. Genesis chapter 1 has done that. It's described all the creatures that God has created to fill the heavens. It's described all the creatures that God has created to fill the earth and the seas and everything else. And among those creatures, who do we have? Man, Adam and Eve. Okay? He's, he's one member of this big family of creatures, and all of them are traceable to God's creative work, his sovereign work through his word and spirit of bringing them into existence out of nothing. Well, in Genesis chapter 2, verse 4, these are the generations of the heavens and the earth, and then what's the focus? One of the creatures they described in Genesis chapter 1. Now we're going to focus in on Adam. Now, here's where things get cool. I mean, that's already pretty cool. But here's where things get really cool. Okay, Genesis 1, 1 through Genesis chapter 2, verse 3 is the first account of creation. Okay, Genesis chapter 2, 4, which is the verse we just started with, through verse 25 is the second account of creation. Okay? And sometimes critical scholars have said, see, these are just kind of different creation accounts written by different authors, and, and they're not really related to each other. They got sloppily pasted together by editors and blah, 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 blah. But that's actually a kind of bad reading of what's going on in this passage. Okay? These two chapters complement each other very well. Okay? One, as we've seen, is the picture of God creating all things. The other is focusing on this one creature Adam. Now, here's the thing. Genesis 1, 1 through Genesis 2, 3, the first creation account. Okay? What name, I mean, look for yourself. What name is applied to the creator in Genesis 1, 1 through Genesis 2, verse 3? God. Anything else? You see anything else there? There's one name, God, right? It's the Hebrew term Elohim. In fact, don't quote me on this, but I think the name Elohim is used 35 times in Genesis 1, 1 through Genesis 2, 3, which, by the way, is 5 times 7. And 7 is an important number in, in, in the opening creation account, right? God creates the seventh day, he rests, and so forth. Elohim. Genesis 2.4. These are the generations of the heaven and the earth when they are created. And the day that, what does it say? The Lord God. Now, God, Elohim. But what's the Lord there? Yeah. The tetragrammaton, four Hebrew letters. We actually don't know how to pronounce it. Yahweh is a, maybe a decent guess. Okay. Elohim is the, the general name for God, right? Sometimes it's applied to gods of, of other nations. Now, the Bible says they're not really gods, okay? But that's, that's a general name for God, like a human being or a cat or whatever. But the name Yahweh is what? It's God's proper name, right? Like Steve or Sandy or Fido or, 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 or whatever, right? This is God's proper name. Now, the question is this. And by the way, I th- again, I think my counting is right on this. Genesis 2, 4 through 2, 25, Yahweh's name, I think, is used 10 times, which also in the Pentateuch is an important number. Pentateuch, the first five books of the Old Testament. Okay, where, is there any other place, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, any other place where 10 is important? Oh, yeah, 10 commandments. <laughs> right? So, so there's probably some intentionality on the part of the author here. Okay? Now, why, in the chapter that's referring to the broad family of all creatures, is the name Elohim used, 
And why in the chapter where we're talking about this particular creature, the human being, why is God's proper name used? Why is God's covenant name used? When God makes a covenant with Israel in Exodus chapter 20, think of the start of the Ten Commandments. What does it say? I am whom? Yahweh, your God. Well, I think that's the answer, isn't it? It's because as we move from God's relation in general to all creatures, to God's relationship with the creature who is made in his image, that special relationship, what territory are we entering? We know from Psalm 95, covenantal territory. Right? And how does God identify himself within the context of the covenant relationship? By his personal name, Yahweh. That's how he relates to Adam. That's how he speaks to Adam. When God comes to make a covenant with Abraham, it says the Lord God, Yahweh God appeared to Abraham. Yahweh God appears to Isaac. Yahweh God appears to Jacob. Okay? It's, it's highlighting the fact that, again, this isn't just a generic relationship between God and creatures. This is that personal covenant bond. So the, the first clue that, again, a, a reader who, who, who is a close reader of the first five books of the Old Testament will be attentive to is that, okay, now we're entering the territory of the covenant because, first of all, we're speaking in the language of the covenant. Speaking of God by his personal covenant name. But the second clue is what we see in verses uh, 16 and 17. What did the Lord God do to Adam? Well, he speaks to him. He addresses him. Okay? But again, specifically, how does he address him? He commands him. Now again, the Pentateuch first five books of the Old Testament, commands. Is that a theme that, that we run in, into where? Anywhere? In, in, oh, yeah! There are like 660, whatever, however many commandments in the Pentateuch. Okay? That's the reason we call it sometimes the law. Because there's so many laws. Right? And the laws are the expression of God's covenant will for his people. Well, what is Genesis 2 portraying God's relationship with Adam? It's a relationship characterized by covenant commands. Now, here's what I want you to see. And, 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 and don't look. If I can, I'll try to trick you. This is a fun trick. Okay? What's the first command? What's the first commandment that God gives Adam in Genesis chapter 2? If, let me ask you this. If we hadn't just read it, what would you say it was? You would say, don't eat, right? That's the first commandment that God gives to Adam in Genesis chapter 2. Don't eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Okay? So let's check ourselves. Let, let's look at the back of the book or the front of the book. Okay? What's the first command that God gave Adam in Genesis chapter 2? God, the Lord God commanded the man saying, you may surely eat. You may surely eat of every tree in the garden. Okay, what's the first command that, that God gives Adam? It's he authorizes Adam's freedom. You see all these wonderful things I've made? Help yourself. You have permission. Okay, you, you are warranted. You are invited. You are authorized. Okay, all of these trees that are good for food, including the tree of life in the middle of the garden. Freely eat. Okay? Now, the second commandment is a prohibition. But, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat for the day that you sh you'll eat it, you shall die. Now, here, 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 here's, this is free. And this, is, this, is, this is a rabbit trail. And I was told not to go on rabbit trails, but I'm going to go on a little rabbit trail. Okay? In Genesis chapter 3, Okay, you remember how when the serpent comes to Eve and he's going to challenge God's word and eventually he's going to say, basically God lied. He's going to say, you shall not surely die. But before he actually explicitly contradicts God's word, what does he do? He doesn't challenge God's word. He asks a question, but it's a very slanted question. and It's a very misleading question. Did God actually say 
don't eat of any tree in the garden? Now, why is that a, what is, why is that a, a, a slanted question? He's describing God's law, God's will for Adam and Eve as what? Restriction. Did he actually say, stay away from all of this stuff? And she says, oh, the tree of knowledge, we can't, eat it. we can't even touch it. Like, she's already bought into the, this picture. Now, what's the point? Genesis 2 and Genesis 3, through the serpent, are giving us very contrasting pictures of God's commandments and his law. Genesis 2 says what? God's law is fundamentally what? Affirming and inviting and summoning and giving permission and only keeping us away from the one thing that would kill us. What's the serpent say? God's commands about keeping good things from you. They're about restricting your freedom. They're about keeping you from being everything you could be if only you were in charge. Okay, so before Satan ever says God lied, he says God's an ogre. You wouldn't want to obey him. Okay, but this is, this is not the picture of Genesis chapter 2. It's authorization and restriction, but fundamentally authorization. Right? Remember when Jesus in Matthew 11 says, Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. I will give you rest. Right? This is the, the summons of, of the lover and the song of songs. Meet me in the field. Right? This, this is the invitation. Okay? Of all the trees in the garden, freely eat. Covenant name, covenant commands, covenant curse. We do see attached to the prohibition not to eat the tree of the life, the, the, the phrase, in the day you shall eat of it, you shall surely die. Now actually, what it says, in the day you eat of it, dying you shall die. And here's where we have really what is, I think, the kind of formal, solemn oath part of, of, of Genesis chapter 2. Dying you will die. Solomon tells a fellow later, it, it keeps. Okay, if, you, if, you, if you go off of house arrest that I've put you under, and the day that you do it, dying you'll die. Okay, this is a formal kind of legal sanction. And the idea is not in the day that you eat, you're going to die literally that day, but the idea is this, in the day that you do it, you're going to have sealed your fate. Okay, you will have crossed the line, you have made yourself culpable, right, and, 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 and the sanction threatened will surely fall on your head. And so we have God's covenant name, right? We've got covenant commands. We have a covenant curse. Then we also have a covenant present, a promise. And here again, we have the oath, but in a sign. Okay, where's, where's the promise? Well, already we've seen that God planted a tree in the midst of the garden. And it's the tree of life. And we know from Genesis chapter 3, it says, if you eat of this tree, what? You'll live forever. Okay. God invited Adam essentially to, to make a choice. Right? Choose life. Think of Joshua, where these were in the promised land. Or choose death. Moses tells Israel before they enter the promised land. Same thing. Choose life or choose death. I've set two ways before you. Okay. And the promise is, in, in following the Lord's will, Right, Adam and Eve will enjoy the life they have, God has set before them. Now, very quickly, uh, I want to mention a, a few things that we see in Genesis 1 and 2 about this promised life, about the promised end that God holds forth to Adam and Eve in the covenant in the garden. Remember, we talked about this in Psalm 95, covenant's a way that expresses the way God owns us and possesses us, the way that we belong to him, the way God moves us through his word, through his voice, but also how he directs us towards what is our ultimate end. Well, Genesis 1 and 2 give us a, a few different images of, of what the ultimate end of human beings is. I mentioned one already in talking about Psalm 95. Therefore I swore in my wrath they shall not enter what? My rest. Well, the first image comes at the conclusion of the first creation account where it says God finished his work and what did he do? He sanctified the seventh day. Okay? And the idea 
to, 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 to make a very long biblical theological argument short is this. Just as God worked six days and created the world and then entered into his rest, and it shouldn't be that we shouldn't understand that God was tired and he had to take a nap. The idea is that if you look at other language in Scripture, Psalm 104, for example, Isaiah 66, heaven is my what? Throne. Earth is my what? Footstool. Where then is the house you will make for me? These passages look back on the creation account and they see God as creating, as it were, a cosmic palace for himself. Well, what does a king do once he's completed his palace building work? He takes up his throne. Okay? And, and, and this is a, a metaphor that we often see in Scripture describe a king seated on his throne. He is resting. He is seated. So, so rest is really God's cosmic enthronement. But, here, but here's, the, the, here's the point. And we see this in the Ten Commandments. We talk about the Sabbath. God made Adam and Eve in his image. And God gave Adam and Eve a, a job to do. Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, have dominion and everything else. Now here's the thing. That's going to take a lot more than six days. Okay? It's going to take entire history to fulfill that commandment. But the idea is this. Adam and Eve are made in God's image. God worked and he finished his creative work and then what did he do? He sat down on his throne. Implicitly, already in Genesis 1, there's the idea that Adam and Eve, as creatures made in his image, they've got a job to do. But one day that job will be complete. One day the earth is going to be filled with image bearers. One day the cultural mandate will be completely finished. And what's going to happen? They, should enter in, they will enter into God's rest, God's royal rest as well. It's interesting when John in his gospel describes Jesus doing the work that the Father gave him to do. And it says, says on the cross, it is finished. And then what does he do? He dies. And interestingly, on John, he rests on the Sabbath day, buried in a tomb, rises on the first day of the week, which is the first day of the new creation. Here, a man has finished the work that God gave him to do, and now has entered into the Father's rest, and he tells, he tells the churches in the book of Revelation, right, as I've worked and now I sit on my Father's throne, you are going to enter into rest with me, right? And blessed are those who die in the Lord, for they will enter into their rest and their labors with them. This is, this is the idea with the, the first imagery of our end, entering into that royal rest. But the second image, it comes in the tree of life itself. It's interesting, Right? There are many ways to picture eternal life in Scripture. But the image chosen in Genesis chapter 2, chapter two is of a tree. Okay. What does that say about the character of eternal life? Well, uh, to make, uh, again, a long argument short, just as rest says something about the, the final blessing that God promised to Adam and Eve, if they would only heed his voice, if they would only embrace his kind fatherly will for them, not only would it be to enter into eternal rest, but it would be enter into eternal life that may be described as a tree of life. You remember Psalm 1? How happy, how blessed is the man who doesn't walk in the counsel of the ungodly or stand in the path of sinners or sit in the seats, all those things. His delight is in the law of the Lord. He meditates day, day and night. He shall be like a what? Tree. Here's what Genesis 2 says. You know what eternal life is? It's like a tree that's planted by living waters that bears its fruit in its season and whatever it does, it prospers. Okay, what, what, what Genesis says is eternal life is flourishing, right? What's the path to human flourishing? Walking in covenant obedience with God. It's entering into royal rest it, it's flourishing like a tree in his presence. And there's one other image Genesis 2 makes. And again, this is something we can only get really reading Genesis 2 and the rest of Scripture. What's the other image? Well, the rest of Genesis 2 talks about what? Not God's covenant with Adam and Eve, but, but the covenant where? Between Adam and Eve. Marriage. What does that have to do with the ultimate end of human beings? God's ultimate purpose, his ultimate promise. Well, you remember when Paul is talking about marriage in Ephesians chapter 5. 
And remember he quotes Genesis 2 and says, For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother, and the two shall become flesh. And then what he says is, Actually, I'm not talking about marriage. I'm talking about Christ and the church. Throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament, God's covenant relationship with his people is described through the imagery of a marriage. And so Genesis 2 essentially is saying this. You know, what, you know what eternal life is for human beings? You know what the end of walking in covenant with God is, of, of following your shepherd's voice, of walking in the way of his commands? You know what it is? It's royal rest. It's flourishing like a tree. It's personal belonging like a marriage. And, and, and that's the, the ultimate goal of the covenant. Now the tragedy is, is what? Genesis chapter 3 is about covenant transgression. And not about Adam and Eve entering into the, the blessing and the beatitude and the flourishing of living in God's presence, but, but inheriting death because of their great transgression. Right? And, and the rest of the Bible is about how God addresses this. And what we'll see in, in later weeks is that the way God addresses this is, is not by kind of saying, well, that was a stupid idea, let's try something else. Okay? But by sending his son, ultimately, in the fullness of time as a second Adam, it's about God bringing us to that place of royal rest, that, that place of flourishing like a tree, that, that place of mutual belonging and a marriage relationship with our covenant God. This is what Christ has come to do. And this is what all the covenants in Scripture, every administration of the covenant of grace is about, bringing us back to this place. Our time's running short. So I want to include, conclude with a few thoughts about uh, kind of practical applications of covenant theology. And I think all of them flow from, from what we've talked about this evening. So... Very quickly, a few points here. Packer says, remember, Christianity is about personal pronouns. It's not just about God and people. It's about God being our God, and about us being his people. Thomas Watson, one of my favorite Puritans, he says the word Eloha, which is the Hebrew word for God, but with, with the, the, the ending, Ha, it's thy God, your God, he says, the word Eloha, thy God, is so sweet, you can never suck all the honey out of it. Why is that? Why, why is that one word in Hebrew, two words in English? Why are they so sweet? Let me suggest four reasons. First, covenant theology gives us reason to pray. We would have time to look at this, but if you look at Psalm 144, for example, there are a million psalms we can look at. The psalmist is reflecting on, on his peril as he's surrounded by enemies and about falsehood and, and he fears the, the, the threat that they are to him. But instead of dwelling on that, Psalm 144 begins with just a litany of descriptions of God, but it's a litany of descriptions of God using personal pronouns. My refuge, my shield, my loving kindness. And he calls upon God to deliver him from his enemies. And then the psalm concludes talking about the, the blessings that come to the people who have been delivered by God from their enemies. And it talks about uh, your, your cattle being prosperous and your sheep bringing forth all kinds of wool and your fields bringing forth all kinds of crops and, and your, your sons being handsome and your daughters being beautiful and, and not running into any problems in the streets. And he says, how happy are the people whose God is the Lord, how happy are the people to whom these blessings fall? What's the point? Okay, covenant gives us reason to pray. And this is what David sees in Psalm 44, 144. When I have problems, what do I do? I call upon the one who is my God. What does it mean that God is my God? We belong to him. Therefore, our problems belong to him. but it also means something else. He belongs to us, and therefore his perfections belong to us.
Francis Turretin, one of my favorite theologians from the 17th century. He says, God so gives himself to us as to be ours, as to all the attributes that he has. He says, they're well said to be ours by fruition and use because of their salutary effects that flow into us. Listen to what he says. Ours is the wisdom of God for direction, the power of God for protection, the mercy of God for remission of sins, the grace of God for sanctification and consolation, the justice of God for the punishment of enemies, the faithfulness of God for the execution of promises, the sufficiency of God for the communication of all manner of happiness. And as sin brought innumerable evils upon us, we find a remedy for all the div- in all the divine properties. Wisdom heals our ignorance and blindness, grace our guilt, power our weakness, mercy our misery, goodness our wickedness, justice our iniquity, the sufficiency and fullness of God our poverty and indigence, fidelity our inconstancy and fickleness, holiness our impurity, and life our death. So covenant theology gives us a reason to pray. Why? Because God owns us and he owns our problems. He takes them as if they're his problems. But also we own God. He belongs to us. And we can claim all of his attributes in time of need. Thomas Watson again says, I cannot be poor as long as God is rich, for his riches are mine. Second, covenant theology not only gives us reason to pray, because we belong to God, and therefore our problems belong to God. He belongs to us, and therefore all his perfections belong to us, so we can call upon him in prayer. Covenant theology that also gives us reason to praise. Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Why? The Lord is a great God, the great King above all gods, but why else? He is our God. And we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hands. That's a reason to rejoice. That's what the psalmist does in Psalm 95. Let us sing to the Lord. For he's not just a great God, but that great God is our God. Last thing I'll leave you you with, we'll talk more about this in coming weeks. Covenant theology gives us a reason to live. We belong to him. We're not our own. That's the other side of the coin. We belong to him. We don't belong to ourselves. What does Paul say in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and, and, and 20? You are not your own. Why? For you were bought with a price. What, 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 what price? The precious blood of Christ. Not with, not with things like silver and gold, Peter says, but with the precious blood of Christ. Of the second person of the Trinity incarnate. A, a value immeasurable. God wasted on us to purchase us. And Paul says, well, If you're not your own, you've been bought with a price, then therefore what? Glorify God in your bodies. He died for those, 2 Corinthians 5, that those who live should what? No longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and rose again. So covenant theology not only gives us reason to pray, not only gives us reason to praise, it gives us reason to live. Okay? And, and this, I think, is, is really the, the mystery, the deep and wonderful and glorious mystery of, of, of what the covenant is all about. Okay? God gives himself to us within the context of covenant in order to give us the privilege of giving ourselves back without reservation, lock, sock, and barrel to him. And, and, and the fullness of, 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 of being a human being doesn't lie in giving ourselves to our friends and our spouses and our children and everything else and whatever else, certainly not the inanimate things that we often give ourselves to in this life. But to be fully what God made us to be is to have the privilege of giving ourselves back to him. Lock, stock, and barrel. That's what covenant theology is about. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you that you have given yourself to be our God and that you have taken us to be your people at the great and precious cost of the blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Grant that we, by the Spirit, whom you have also given to us in the covenant, may give ourselves back to you.
for the glory of your great name, of the Lord God Almighty, and for our good, for our ultimate royal rest in your presence, for our ultimate flourishing like a tree of life, for our ultimate joy of knowing that our beloved is ours and we are his. And we ask it in Christ's name. Amen.